You are listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagun Yedile and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Body Banter. My name is Claudia Krebs, and I'm joining you from the unceded ancestral territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, also known as Vancouver, Canada. And I'm here, of course, with uh, Shagan Oyadeli. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Body Banter. Uh, I'm joining you from Kelowna, which is in the unceded and ancestral territories of the Silks Okanagan Nations. And today we have a really important guest, and I'm really looking forward to what she has to say. Uh, Michelle, would you please int uh, introduce yourself and uh, tell us about yourself? Sure. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, so my name is Michelle Turner. Um, I'm a white midwife coming from Vancouver, uh, the unceded Musqueam, Squamish and Salatooth Nations land. Um, I'm a clinical assistant professor of midwifery in the Faculty of Medicine at UBC. And I also um, I'm also a midwife in the community in, in Vancouver. So I work, um, I, I deliver babies <laughs> at home and in uh, primarily I'd say BC Women's Hospital is kind of my home, my home, my home institute. Michelle, we're so glad to have you here. We of course know each other well. We've been teaching together for a couple of years. Uh, we teach a midwifery course, well, uh, sorry, an anatomy course for midwifery, I should say. Um, so nice to have you here to share your unique perspective on uh, the body. Thank you. Agreed. And I, I feel Claudia and I um, ha have this neat dance that we do together with Claudia's uh, anatomy expertise and my clinical expertise. And I think we find this way of kind of dancing through the material, um, touching on both sides throughout the course, which is something I really have enjoyed over the last few years working with you on. Absolutely. Me too. It's, it's always a pleasure. It's one of those courses that I really enjoy teaching um, because of you and because of the collaboration and our students are marvelous as well. I should true. add, <laughs> yeah, they're pretty awesome. Um, so as a midwife, you have such a unique perspective on the human body, especially when you look at the practice of midwifery in the community and, um, and sort of the direct relationships that you build with pregnant folks. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, and I would say a lot of folks actually don't know a lot about what midwives do in, in BC. Um, so I'll actually give a little background just so that everyone's on the same page. So midwives in, in BC are primary care providers. So we provide the medical care um, kind of on our own direction for pregnancy, uh, for the birth, and then for, well, up to three months postpartum, but I would say for most, in most contexts, it's about six weeks postpartum. So in the six weeks following the birth, we would support uh, the medical care of the newborn and also uh, the, the person who gave birth, the new parent. Um, so you know, we do things like order uh, blood work and ultrasounds. Uh, we also are lucky to have longer appointment times. So I think one of the gifts of my profession is that um, we often have appointment times that are about 30 minutes, maybe sometimes even 45 minutes um, at each visit, which gives us a, a good amount of time to get to know our clients, get to know their context, um, and provide ideally um, kind of an ideal world uh, medical care that supports their goals um, in of their pregnancy and of their birth. Um, and one of the things we can do is uh, deliver babies both at home or in hospital, depending on the client's preferences and medical context, um, uh, which again allows us to be adaptable to the specific, um, I would say, healthcare family needs um, and goals of our clients. Uh, so I, in terms of working with them, it, you know, you're working in a transformational time. I mean, pregnancy is a time where you um, are becoming a parent, you're growing a family, um, you're, uh, you know, you have 
it's a strange time when your body is changing in a remarkable way. Um, I mean, growing another human, like what? Like that's <laughs> a pretty incredible thing to imagine. Um, and I remember the first birth I was at, that is exactly how it felt. I was like, a, a, not, there was another person in the room, like what? <laughs> Even though, of course, you knew there was going to be a baby involved. Um, but it's just, you know, if you think about it, it's pretty mind blowing. But then, of course, we also deal with the details, right? Like we might manage a postpartum hemorrhage um, if someone is bleeding more than we would expect. We would suture after the baby's born. So we need to know the anatomy of the perineal muscles. So it's both kind of the macro and the micro, um, which I think is a really uh, lovely, a lovely role to play in kind of supporting new communities. You're going to get like so many applications for the UBC midwifery program after that pitch, because that was just beautiful. Who would not want to be a midwife after that description? Um, I'm kind of thinking maybe I should just do that now. Um, <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I'm really interested in that transformation of the body. When you follow your clients through their pregnancy, you often get them in the first trimester as things are just sort of starting. And then the human body has this remarkable capability to adapt and to, um, to grow a human, to grow an organ, to support the growing human. Um, what is that experience, that bodily experience like for your clients? Yeah. And I mean, I would say, so I, I haven't given birth myself, so I can't speak to that from like a direct experience perspective. Um, I would say a couple of things is one, what's fascinating to me is how different everyone experiences pregnancy and birth. Um, and it's hard to really explain to someone who's not attended multiple births truly like I have had a client who um, gave birth with each of her four birth babies in 30 minutes from start to finish. Like that is shockingly fast. And in fact, overwhelmingly fast. Um, and, and I think, I think she would have preferred a much slower birth in all honesty. Whereas I've had others who have had three, four days of labor, some of which is early labor, certainly, but three, four days of very difficult, long, exhausting labor. Many of the time ends in a C-section, but not always. Um, certainly I've seen many vaginal births after such a difficult labor and then everything in between. And pregnancy is the same. So some people say they feel they're most well when they're pregnant, their mood stabilizes, um, they have this kind of renewed sense of vitality. And I had another client who had um, basically pregnancy induced, um, uh, what do you like? Uh, I can't think of the word right now. When like when you're in your ear, it, it malfunctions such that you're dizzy all the time. Vertigo. Sorry, she had pregnancy induced vertigo such that she couldn't drive a car. She couldn't even sit in a car, and she had to see a neurologist to get have exercises just so that she didn't feel like she was falling over all the time. Again, most somewhere in between. Um, so just the experiences are so varied. And I think a lot of our role as clinicians is really kind of navigating with the individual, kind of uh, navigating with the individual, finding supports to help people kind of manage something that is temporary. Um, so for example, the, you know, we have a lot of pelvic changes in, in pregnancy and preparation for the birth, which is of course great for birth, but hard for life. Um, so you have a bit of an unstable pelvis in pregnancy and how do you support clients? So how do you adapt, you know, write letters for work so they can adapt how they, you know, sit or don't sit at their desk. Um, maybe they, maybe they should see a pelvic floor physiotherapist or a chiropractor to help support pelvic stability. Maybe wear a band um, for pelvic girdle pain, or maybe it's really um, just about, uh, you know, keeping your feet up and resting more because we live in a world where we expect people to work a lot, <laughs> even while pregnant. Um, so I think a lot of it is about kind of managing on an individual level, um, trying to find community and individual supports medically where possible. Uh, and then also just how we navigate that, navigate a, a process that is very individual. Um, and we can't always say where things are going to go, but we know that most of the time it works out well. Yeah, Michelle, and, and that's a great segue into my question, which I can I can see that you're quite 
passionate about what you do. And uh, it, it occurs to me, though, that um, there seems to be just like a heteronormative um, approach to, the ed to education, um, generally in anatomy, uh, as well as in health professions generally, where it's always like a perfectly shaped, have you seen those pregnancy diagrams <laughs> it's a perfectly shaped abdomen that's you know the illustrated uh, the, you know everything just looks perfect and the baby comes out just on time and so on and so forth which as you're describing that's really not the experience uh, do you want to speak to to this uh the lack of diversity in the way we educate our our health profession student and perhaps maybe your thoughts about what we can do to change that Sure. I mean, it, I didn't. I didn't mention at the beginning uh, the details, but some of my, um, in terms of some of my PhD work right now, is looking at how we teach uh, towards equity. And obviously, my area of focus is uh, kind of childbirth and midwifery education. But of course, that you know, a lot of people deliver babies, nurses, uh, midwives, um, obstetricians, uh, family doctors. Even possibly nurse practitioners, I think there's a shift towards supporting nurse practitioners in that work. So just to say that I think that it applies to a lot of us, even if it seems like a specialized field, if that makes sense. Um, so, I mean, I would say certainly there's I mean, a lot of heteronormativity within midwifery. And I think, in fact, the second wave feminist movement um, really used that. Um, as part of um, their, I would say, push for regulated midwifery within Canada. Um, but I think there's a real reckoning that midwives currently need to reflect upon in the ways in which um, racialized bodies, fat bodies, um, uh, disabled or differently abled bodies have been erased in those stories. Um, and so a lot of my work uh, is thinking about how might we teach more towards an equity lens. Um, and, I, and part of that is, I think, within the history of, of I would say, medicine, um, including obstetrical uh, sciences and anatomical science, there's a, a history of kind of linear progression from like this past where we knew nothing um, to this present where we're enlightened. And of course, many of us know that comes from an enlightenment thinking that seems to have emerged uh, in the 15, 16, 1700s. Um, and a lot of that erases the history of harm that we've caused as clinicians and as scientists, um, anatomical scientists, science, science was used very explicitly um, to support racism, to support um, the maintenance of the slave trade, uh, in fact, particularly within, um, uh, within obstetrics, we know um, that uh, black midwives were delivering babies um, as slaves. Uh, they were supporting the growth of educational uh, knowledge that we benefit from today. Um, we also know that uh, black folks um, in the US in particular uh, were experimented upon to support, um, support uh, fistula repair. Uh, and when we don't name those stories, we support the story of anatomy that is one that are, that is inherently good and doesn't 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 require reflection because it's quote unquote um, quote unquote unbiased quote unquote neutral quote if that makes any sense. And I think what's really important to me is that we reflect upon the work we're doing now continuously so we don't continue to replicate those harms because I was actually reading not too long ago, um, like last week I was reading a story about the history of sexuality uh, within, um, within Canada. And there's a story out of um, uh, the sick kids in Toronto in 1915 where uh, a girl of the age of nine was um, was diagnosed with uh, uh, with was diagnosed with uh, chronic masturbation because uh, that was a diagnosis um, that one could have and it um, it was seen as harmful it caused degeneracy that's their language um, and so uh, the doctors performed a clitoridectomy um, to in effect uh, cure this child and lit it literally ended saying you know that the client was discharged uh, cured 
Um, and there's two ways of hearing that story. One is to say it's awful. And of course it's awful. And we can all agree upon that, no question. Um, but we can interpret that awfulness as, okay, that was the past. That's something that we now we know so much, right? Now we know not to think of masturbation as something that's harmful. We are so progressive. Or we can think of it as at the time, people were working under assumptions that made sense to them. And they were making decisions that made sense to them under the worldview of the time, which is no different than now with us in the sense that we are also making decisions that are based on our understanding of the world at our time. And that, that isn't fixed, that's gonna change. And I think the more we reflect on what we do and how we teach, and which, what knowledge we prioritize and how we prioritize, which stories we tell, which ones we ignore, um, the more we reflect upon that, I think the more we can work towards um, a science that is imbued with equity so that we're not harming as we have done and continue to do. Thank you, Michelle. That's a really strong statement for knowing your history, knowing the history of your discipline, and reflecting quite critically upon that. We didn't come here um, in sort of an ethereal, pure way. We came here in a very messy human way. And as much as um, I am fascinated by enlightenment and the call to knowledge, um, we can't stop there, right? We can't say, oh, um, human history started with Immanuel Kant saying, dare to know, because that's that was really cool when he said that. <laughs> um, because what came before and what came after certainly um, perpetuated the worst in humans. And I think it's important to remember that at the time they thought it was all okay. And we are doing things that we think are okay that history may judge us on. Well, we'll certainly judge us on. Um, yeah. So what impact do you think that has on an enlightened, <laughs> let me say that, um, anatomy education? Well, I think, I think there's a tendency um, within medicine generally, uh, and I think it's improving, um, but I do think there's a tendency towards doctor, midwife, nurse knows best. Um, and I think that comes from a place of um, knowing that we do know a lot, we have a lot of experience as clinicians and we are very skilled in what we do um, both individually and collectively. Um, but I think that is important and we all know that's important. We all need skilled clinicians to support well-being. Um, but we also need to listen to our, our clients and what they tell us. For example, so a client might not realize that it is normal to have, let's say, a drier vagina after they give birth. And they may have some discomfort in the perineal area because quite often, especially with the first, we, we suture. So we, um, we, we stitch uh, the, uh, usually a second degree repair, which involves... Um, muscles of the perineum. Um, and we suture those to, to improve integrity, um, to avoid things like incontinence later in life, meaning it's really important. Um, but if a client doesn't realize that it's normal to feel a little bit of discomfort, but that it should gradually improve if they don't know that it's safe to talk to us as clinicians because they feel nervous about asking questions, they won't necessarily speak up um, and say that, hey, um, actually when I have sex now, it's like three months after the birth, um, it's really painful and actually it's getting worse. Um, and they may not realize that there are treatments with medications and pelvic floor physiotherapy. And if we present, um, as clinicians in a, I know best kind of approach, um, it can silence people, I think, um, to speaking up when we need to hear their stories in order to provide good care. Um, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, you know, and and I and I I don't know. I wonder. I mean, you're talking about people's stories, and I mean, from the time we've started this conversation today, it, it's so clear that people's individual stories, people collective stories, people's histories, and who they are, and what they bring 
to you as the medical professional, healthcare professional really matters. And, and, and so um, there's an increasing movement and uh, I hear it a lot when we teach our students in years one and two for them to, to listen uh, to the patient, uh, let the patient tells you, tell you their story and don't prejudge anything and don't assume anything and don't come from this highfalutin doctor knows all. Um, but I still find that it persists, interestingly, and I don't know whether you get that experience, you know, so so I see students a lot from progression from years one and two, and then we meet them at graduation, and sometimes we, some of them come back, um, and some of them come back as professors into the program, and, and I'm amazed how they seem to get encultured <laughs> into the system that they meet really, really, like, it's so despite of anything we may teach they just get into the culture of the profession and everything seems a lot of it seems to evaporate and i don't know from your perspective whether you you see that in in training midwives as well how how the profession shapes them rather than what we actually teach yeah i think it's very similar um and certainly i think you know a midwifery uh in its current incarnation i at least attempts to really prioritize informed decision making from early on, um, which I do think has a tendency uh, to uh, kind of promote a sort of shared decision making approach. Um, but the truth is, is we become clinicians and we are also people. And what happens, I think, is sometimes we also start to feel um, the challenges uh, and the stresses of being providers, which are also very real. And I think sometimes there's a silence around that. And I think it sound, I think that's the culture that persists a little bit, which is somehow that I'm immune to being up all night and then managing a neonatal resuscitation. And somehow it doesn't affect me. Like it's a, I'm tired. It's harder when you're tired. And it's hard to resuscitate a newborn, like emotionally, like, yes, I know how to do it. Yes, it usually works really well. And yes, you know, I save a life. Great. <laughs> it seems like a good and a well, a, a good story, um, but it's hard. Um, and it's also sometimes hard when people make decisions that differ from your recommendations. And while I support that in my clients, um, philosophically and practically, it doesn't mean it isn't isn't uh, hard at times because I also have to manage as a clinician, sometimes, not always, but sometimes the implications of those decisions. Um, and that can be hard on me. It can be hard on my team. Um, but I think there's uh, sometimes a culture of, um, I don't know, kind of one-upmanship. I don't know the word to say, but, you know, kind of that I also am kind of beyond human because there's a real push within, I think, all of our professions for to have really top grades, to be kind of the best, quote unquote. That's how we measure success. We measure success also by, you know, getting into more specialized programs, that is programs where individuals earn more and more money, meaning all of these systems promote a certain way of thinking. And I think we like to th think that as educators, we can transform the world. And I think in small ways we do, I do. But I also think, um, I think we're naive. <laughs> I think a lot of a lot of our work is small compared to, you know, changing a culture uh, within and also cultures within organizations. Like I've seen the differences working in one hospital and another and how um, midwives can be really well integrated in one institution and going to work is a pleasure. It feels very collegial. Um, I don't hesitate to contact a physician colleague for a quick question um, and vice versa and be in other institutions where it feels um, where I feel like no matter what I say or do, I'm going to be chastised or said, you know, I'll be told I'm not doing something correctly in front of my client, you know, things that I think are quite unprofessional um, and how that impacts the care we provide. And that's even within this micro culture of, you know, BC or let's say Canada, because I've worked in different jurisdictions, um, let alone, you know, throughout the world. So the capacity we have as educators to change, uh, I think, is sometimes more limited than we wish. <laughs> Fell first by bubble, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm hearing a couple of things, and I'd, I'd love to continue sort of that conversation into those. One is the humanity of the individual, like the educator, the clinician, the client, the student, the body we learn from. Um, and then the other thing that I was thinking of, like, do we as professionals, as educators, do we hoard our knowledge and not share it enough? Are we failing to educate people about their own bodies? Um, why is it still so hard for people to know where their pancreas is, let alone where, you know, where their clitoris is for some, right? Um, why is it so difficult to have those conversations? And um, why are we not doing a better job of educating? everybody about this anyway so there's a lot in there take what you want from that <laughs> um well I, I i fully agree and i mean that's my bias and sort of why i'm doing my phd in education because <laughs> while while i just said i i think we over you know think i i think we overestimate our capacity as educators i still obviously have some sort of deep-seated belief in the power of education otherwise i wouldn't be doing my phd in it <laughs> Um, I'm so relieved. <laughs> <laughs> um, that being said, um, I do think <clears throat> we, uh, as clinicians, as educators, as um, scientists, you know, there is a value, like a cultural capital, I would say, in us keeping knowledge to ourselves. Mm, and it, there's also a kind of cultural capital to us having fancy words because that makes it less accessible to um, communities who may not have had the benefits of, you know, you know, high, beyond high school education. Um, and I think it reinforces the power that we have. And I say this at a macro level, like I don't think any of us or very few of us, and I'm sure there are some that are this way, but I think most of us are doing our best, um, you know, to break down barriers, to, um, provide in information to our clients to support their well-being and we're not trying to hoard information so to speak but I do think there's sort of an incent an incentive at a kind of macro level to have kind of professional knowledge um, in order so that I can say hey I'm a midwife and I know something important that you someone else doesn't know and that way I have a profession that someone will financially support um, and that I therefore benefit from and I kind of think it really needs to be, we need to really flip the table a bit and really encourage um, more sharing of expertise. Um, in terms of midwifery, one of the kind of tenants within Canada um, is informed decision-making. And that comes from a philosophy, um, you know, that is imperfect certainly, but the philosophy is such that we do our best as clinicians to provide the pros and cons of the various decisions that clients may take in pregnancy. And then we respect the decision that they make, um, even if it's an, uh, one that we don't agree with. So the informed consent model tends to be a little bit more, um, <clears throat> more like um, here are the risks. I, I recommend surgery. Here are the risks and benefits of surgery. I already recommend it. Do you agree? And certainly people will decline and people can decline surgeries. Um, but uh, I think an informed decision-making approach is talking through also what are the implications if I decide not to have surgery? Um, what happens then? Can I postpone surgery by a few, let's talk in terms of C-sections. Can we wait an hour to see if, the, if, um, if the, if I give birth within the next hour, would, would, would that be a reason for me not to have surgery? You know, what, how can I kind of, um, maybe what middle grounds do we have here? And a lot of that is about education and us talking to our clients and saying, well, uh, I don't know. I do recommend a C-section, let's say right now, but that you, because you've had a really long labor and I'm worried that it may lead to you being exhausted an infection, a postpartum hemorrhage. However, uh, the fetus is doing really well right now. So I'm actually not worried this moment. I actually think it would be reasonable to wait another hour and we could reassess. What do you think? And when we add that middle layer, it gives a sense of choice and a sense of agency. And I think some clients will decide for the C-section right away 
because that's that's their preference and they agree with that kind of recommendation. Whereas others will say, no, it's really important me for me. As long as it's still reasonably safe to wait another hour, I would like to wait another hour. So it's how do we find that middle ground so people aren't given the option of kind of almost one extreme or another and are given kind of a range, a spectrum of choice so that they feel that they can make a decision. But of course, in order to do that, we have to provide information. We have to provide uh, knowledge um, that we have as clinicians. And we have to be upfront, I think, um, because it can be easy for us to become coercive in, in the language we use um, based on our, our opinions. Um, so yeah, I went a little bit sideways on that one, but yes, the short answer is, I, I, I think <laughs> I part of my research is wanting to go into schools with, with young people and teach about birth. So that, of course, it, it comes from the idea that we need to be sharing this knowledge sooner. And um, just to keep going one more second, I was um, in doing some OSCE examinations um, for um, internationally educated midwives who come to Canada um, to uh, kind of basically learn the system here, which is a little different than where most people are coming from. Um, and so they go through some standardized assessments for, you know, for example, managing a postpartum hemorrhage and how we do it here in the context that we have here. Um, and for that, we work with actors. Um, so the actors, and I'm sure this is similar in the medical school, um, where they perform, um, let's say, having a hemorrhage, or they perform um, a difficult labor. Um, and uh, one of the actors said to me, was like, Can, I, I, I don't know anything about birth. Like, I don't know how to pretend I'm in labor. I don't know. Like, how did I get to being in my 30s and know nothing about what I, I can't perform this because all I have to go on is what I've seen in the media. And I'm like, yeah, no, that's not how birth works. <laughs> so there we went through like an acting lesson <laughs> in preparation for our OSCE exam. And I was like, exactly. Like people are in their thirties and they don't have a sense of what pregnancy, childbirth and early parenting looks like. And what a shame. I mean, we, even if you don't want to have a baby, um, that is okay, but we all are implicated. We're all here because someone gave birth birth to us in some capacity. Um, so that's kind of knowing our origin story. Um, and I think we're holding the, those keys a little too uh, tightly. Yeah, Michelle, absolutely. And I think it, it, we don't talk about the body, right? Ever. Like we just kind of take our body for granted and as long as it's working, it's okay. And I think you're in a really unique position in watching over a period of nine months, a body transform um, and people maybe discovering for the first time their body and having that introspection. I remember when I was pregnant, I'd be, I'd have these introspective moments of, you know, feeling the changes and feeling um, the kicks and, and all of those things, which usually I don't pay attention to what's happening inside of my body. And there um, I really had that introspection and that, I guess, profound connection with my body. And I mean, I'm coming from, I'm an anatomist. I know <laughs> the insides and everything. And I was still connected and fascinated in a, in a completely different way. So do you find that this might be for many folks, the first time that they have that intimate connection um, with their body? that they usually just kind of walk around their days as we pretend that we're all just ethereal brain beings. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I also think, and I mean, labor, there's nothing like labor to kind of be aware of your body <laughs> um, in the sense of, I think pregnancy is a really, uh, what's nice about pregnancy and then what's hard about pregnancy is that it's long, meaning you have time to kind of come to terms and, or get excited and or get scared and or, um, you know, ask lots of questions about what it's like to give birth, what it's like to be a parent. Um, and I think we're used to, I would say, a, when it comes to labor, we're used to a kind of pain that is kind of external in a way. Um, and I don't, of course, pain isn't external, but meaning like I trip, I fall, I injure myself, something external did that to me. Whereas with pregnancy and birth and with like kind of contractions, I feel people often describe it as kind of unusual because it's something that's almost, it's like their body, their body, but it's happening to them. Like, it's like they're, 
it it's a it's a it's not something external that impacted it's something internal that's happening and it's a matter of letting go um as a way of coping rather than controlling as a way of coping um and i mean maybe you can speak to that more than i can um but just to say that that's been kind of my experience is kind of almost in meditative ways like practices that kind of support uh clients to sort of watch in effect um contractions come over their body even though obviously it is their body does that make any sense but almost seeing like being able to notice in in that kind of meditative way it happening to you um because i think otherwise it can be quite overwhelming um and especially for folks who have a really fast labor um i've heard people describe it differently some have said it's like they like literally it felt like laying an egg <laughs> but just like this this head was just roaring through my pelvis or like pooping um is a common analogy for pushing um but almost a sort of guttural like uh reflex and there is something called the ferguson reflex that we think of um we need to come up with a better name for that claudia um, <laughs> um but i think oh it's the fetus ejection reflex i think that's the other name perfect uh, we know our eponyms <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah the fetus ejection reflex but it, it is very much like a reflex so something that you're not we're not used to our bodies changing in such profound ways especially after no longer being a child and you know reaching our kind of growth um maximum we sort of assume this idea of stability but of course pregnancy is you know the complete opposite of that in so many ways uh, it's been so fascinating talking to you michelle and i just wanted to um maybe get back to your lens on uh, equity and and uh inclusion uh in in what you do um before we started we were discussing some of your kind of passion in this area and some of the things that you wanted to uh you know to just kind of reflect on you know and i'm i'm wondering whether this is the time to to ask you to do that um you know because i'm wondering whether you've had experiences with perhaps the indigenous population um you know in terms of their approach to childbirth uh and so on and and like we were saying earlier where you have this heteronormative um uh you know view that's that we teach and, and i'm wondering whether anything you've encountered in your in your uh, training or practice um really has shifted your view on on practice among our indigenous uh, first nations people do you um do you have any reflections on that yeah i mean i would say a few things as i i flagged at the outset that i'm a i'm a white settler um midwife where my dad was born in england um and immigrated here and my mom has been you know her family has been in canada for many many generations um of western european uh, descent um so i would say i definitely am not someone who can speak to indigenous birth practices at all um what i do know uh, kind of speaking to equity is that um uh, we have perpetuated the forced evacuation of Indigenous people off land for generations now um, to birth in larger institutions. And midwifery has um, been complicit in um, sort of devaluing Indigenous midwifery uh, to the detriment of Indigenous communities. And I think at this point, you know, we need to be taking stronger action um, towards reconciliation in that regard. Um, I mean, I, I would say, I would say I, I would speak to an Indigenous midwife <laughs> is what I would do. Um, and, and I'm sure they could speak more, um, to their work. Um, but I do know, uh, of wonderful Indigenous midwives that work in, um, in Vancouver that are, are really pushing for equity amongst Indigenous, uh, communities, um, both here, but also throughout the province and throughout Canada um and again it's i think about thinking about what stories matter and it, it's been pretty common within midwifery to think of midwifery as in effect emerging with the with the resurgence of um 
of regulated midwifery in, you know, 20, 25 years ago in Canada, because we were one of the last, if not the last, I can't, I'm not sure, um, industrialized uh, nations to have regulated uh, midwifery, um, which, you know, isn't a, a claim to fame. Um, uh, that being said, it, it then ignores the history of midwives who've been working within this uh, country and on these lands for a generation. So I don't know that I can speak to some of that directly. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know I can speak to that directly, but I think the action needs to come from Indigenous midwives um, and they would be able to speak more to that than I can. Thanks, Michelle. And we'll reach out maybe to some people that you can recommend to us. Absolutely. It would be lovely to hear that perspective. Thanks for directing us uh, in that way. Now, as a midwife, you obviously have a unique relationship with the human body and, um, and we teach anatomy together. Um, and I know we're not supposed to have favorites, but <laughs> what's your favorite body part? Well, Claudia, like, how could it not be the perineal body? <laughs> <laughs> like the it perineal has to... body, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so it has to be because I, I mean, I don't know if how many of you have witnessed a birth but it is incredible <laughs> that that basically how much a perineal body can stretch and then and 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 kind of allow for uh, a head <laughs> a, of a of a, a fetus and then baby to come through and then within moments like instantaneously we're going from think of it I don't you probably know the centimeters better than I do but I would say around three centimeters to maybe 10 to 15 centimeters in terms of change back to three centimeters in the course of you know maybe an hour tops from start to finish of what I just described um uh, it is remarkable um and then of course I have to have two because if I say the perineal body, then I also have to say the skull of the fetal head or the newborn head, which is also just so remarkable that evolutionarily we've developed this really unique uh, head at birth or prior to birth where the bones aren't fused. Um, and that way they can move and accommodate the pelvis as the baby is born such that those bones kind of, well, I mean, they're attached by sutures, but, but just to say they can maneuver around each other um, to accommodate for the various positions, the various pelvis shapes, um, and then again, unaccommodate <laughs> over the subsequent few hours to days, depending on the birth. I think it's just a remarkable evolutionary feat um, and also combined a quite a uh, remarkable system and I don't know how else to say something is beautiful but I think there's something very beautiful about the perineum. There certainly is and um, the capacity to adapt to the needs of the situation is um, is absolutely amazing. What's your least favorite body part? Oh I don't know. Uh, <laughs> least favorite hmm what's your least favorite oh we've gone through this so i had like a combination of guts and toes and shagan what was yours again appendix i said oh right <laughs> appendix <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think that is a really hard one i would say because I was like, no, but like toes are so interesting. No, but guts are so interesting too. <laughs> <laughs> appendix, honestly, I have no opinion on the appendix. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I would say that one, I don't know I could answer. I'll, I'll have to think on it and I'll get back to you <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> That's fair. That's awesome. Um, and you don't have to have a least favorite body part. You know, we can um, value them all um, as we do. And I, I do like toes and guts just not as much as brains. There you go. Fair. <laughs> and the perineal body now. <laughs> Come on, Claudia, you have to enjoy the perineal body. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Michelle, thank you. It's been so wonderful to have you here and share your perspectives and your stories. Um, I really look forward to 
the impact that your PhD work is going to have on the community. Um, I, I think it's going to be really wonderful to develop um, a curriculum that incorporates pregnancy and childbirth at very young ages. Um, I do think it will make a difference and I think you'll have an impact and make a change. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you Thank so you. much, Michelle. We're lovely Thank having you. you today. It's been a pleasure. Nice spending time with you all. Thanks. And that concludes another episode of Body Banter. Be sure to join us for our next episode. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time. <laughs>